once again to the open mic, Writers in Their Own Words, where every show I talk to writers about their work, the publishing industry, and how they do what they do. The show is available by the same name on both YouTube and via all of the major podcast platforms, and you can subscribe to either or to both, which of course would be my preference, so you never miss a thing. And that would be a really good thing because my guest today, well, she's definitely a writer, uh, which we're going to talk about a little bit before we're all done here, but I'm really interested to hear from her today about her main gig, which is as a book reviewer. For publications like Crime Spree Magazine, Mystery Scene, Publishers Weekly, and Kirkus Reviews. She's also an editor at the River Heights Book Review. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Katrina Nidis Holmes to home. Gotta get that right to the open mic. Katrina, how are you doing today? I'm all right. Thanks so much for having me. How are you today? I cannot complain about anything. Uh, you know, I kind of subscribe to the old Tommy the sort of thing, you know. Uh there's no point talking about your troubles anyway, because 80% of the people don't care and 20% are glad to know you have them. So you're better just to soldier on regardless of whatever else is happening in your life, right? Absolutely. Well, let's get started here. Uh, we met recently at uh, VoucherCon 2023 in San Diego. We were on a panel together and I, I, it had never occurred to me <laughs> in the years I've been doing this to have someone come on the show to talk about uh, being a book reviewer. And yet that is such a critical thing for writers to get reviews. So I, I'm really uh, glad that you're here today because I really want to talk to you about this. Well, I'm honored to be the first then. That's fantastic. Absolutely. You're, you're my writing. debut book reviewer. I, I, I You know, it's <laughs> funny. I've had, I've had playwrights and songwriters, of course, lots and lots of crime fiction and mystery writers. And, uh, I've had White House chief correspondent, uh, on and on, you know, all the kind of odd things for you know, people to do, right? I've never had a book reviewer. So here we are. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Let's get started with the most basic thing, which is how did you get started as a book reviewer and how long have you been doing this? So I actually have to credit uh, a platform far formerly known as Twitter back before it became kind of a the toxic dumpster fire that it is now. I'd say about 12 years ago or so, my husband, uh, writer Chris Holm, was kind of just really getting into writing his, I think it was probably his debut novel at that time, and he was writing on weekends, and to fill the time, while well, I had to sit there and be quiet and not disturb him, because we had a small apartment at that time, uh, I was reading, but I was reading a lot of books, and it was getting to be a very expensive <laughs> uh, time filler, so there was a woman on Twitter, um, it was a romance author named Beverly Kendall, who had sort of a, I guess it was a romance book blog at the time, but she was looking to expand and she wanted to know if anyone who followed her on Twitter would be interested in reviewing mysteries for her. And my husband's like, this is a pretty good gig here. Uh, why don't you just give it a shot? You've always said that's that would be the dream to get to, you know, to be paid to read books for a living. And, you know, not quite a living, but they to read books. And so I reached out to her and uh, I said, well, do I have to buy the books or get the books myself? And she sort of laughed and was like, oh, no, we'll have no trouble. You'll have books coming out of your ears. And, and that turned out to be true. Like I would she'd send me like 10 books a month and I would happily plow through them. I started getting some um blurbs on the backs of books, much to my delight. And then uh, Criminal Element at that time was kind of um, just getting started and they solicited me to do some of their fresh meat pieces, which got me onto some, I got me on Crime Spree's um, kind of radar and John Jordan. And then I ended up on a panel at, I wanna say it was left Coast Crime Monterey with Jordan Foster, who is also a Publishers Weekly and Kirkus reviewer. We became good friends. Um, she and I worked together briefly on a website called The Life Sentence. We were both editors. Um, I was kind of an editor in their social media maven. And when that went under, she was like, you know, if you ever want a recommendation for Publishers Weekly and Kirkus, you don't get a byline, but you get paid. Um, and it's a fun gig. So I took her up on that. They, to my surprise, took me on. And uh, I've kind of been expanding my coverage there ever since, taking on different categories and whatnot. Um, and then 
that's kind of how I fell into the mystery scene thing too, as long as they were around, you know, I was just a regular reviewer and they liked my, you know, kind of individual reviews and asked me to come on as the small and independent press columnist. And I had a great amount of fun doing that. Um, while I, I probably did that for about two years before they stopped publication late last year. So that's my career as it was in a nutshell. Wow. Well, you, obviously you were good at what you did because people <laughs> kept offering you more opportunities. That's always a great sign. Yeah. Now, I know you you focus a lot on mysteries, but uh, do you consider yourself at this point to have a specialty or more of a generalist? I would say I am more of a generalist. I Mysteries are my first love as a reader. I grew up just consuming mysteries as fast as I could find them. Um, and that's what I started out reviewing. I now review uh, a lot of YA for Publishers Weekly and do a lot of interviews with authors there. And uh, for Kirkus, it's more of a, I guess I would say general fiction. There's a little bit of crime fiction, but um, there's also a lot of horror and kind of a lot of, I guess you would call it speculative fiction. Hmm. There's a little sci-fi tossed in it here and there. So, I, you know, I don't do any nonfiction. It's not really my thing I think college kind of burned me out on that. Right. um but I'd say you know pretty a, a wide selection of fiction now was your path fairly typical you think or uh is there generally uh well, like baseball with the minor leagues you know where you start out you, you know you have to do the smallest things possible and work your way up to something like Pub publishers weekly you know what how typical, I guess, was your pathway? I don't know if I can speak to typical. Um, I do think that, I mean, they do require writing samples, so I do think you have to get your start somewhere. Um, and I think a lot of people get their start sort of with um, book blogging back when that was a, a bigger thing. I mean, some people, there are still some big names like Christopher Zygorski has obviously made his, carved out his niche in the mystery community with his blog. Um, Publishers Weekly still, like I got in because I knew somebody, but they do still advertise occasionally for reviewers and you work your way up through there. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, if you have an interest in reviewing and you want to get started, there's absolutely no reason you have to find someone to employ you or to get the books for you, especially now that kind of NetGalley and Edelweiss um, have made such a big presence in the market. It used to be that you had to get physical galleys from the publisher and get them to send them to you. And now so many of them are available digitally and you just have to prove that you're covering the, you know, at least a percentage of the books that they send you. Um, you can put it on your blog. I know plenty of um, bookstagrammers or book talkers that get their books that way. So they don't have to be written reviews. Uh, some people just cover everything on Goodreads. And I think that publishers are just so happy to get coverage, enthusiastic coverage of books from early readers just to kind of create a groundswell, you know, movement for books that um, you can kind of chart your own path any way you want to these days. It's kind of a, it's nice. It's much less, um, I think, strictured and structured than it was when I got into it, which is kind of wonderful. That's really interesting to me. Um, and, and well, I'll ask, I was going to ask you something that came to my mind, but I'll ask you a little bit later. Um, you know, What's the basic mindset you take in to a book review? Do you, uh, or the approach maybe, are there specific things that you're looking for? Um, how genre specific is it? I know you said you're more of a generalist, but of course, you know, you're, you're really um, uh, well-versed in mystery. Are there, are there certain things you look for or certain things that are, you know, that are probably going to lean the review one way or the other? Mm -hmm. I think um, for me, what always puts a book over the top is voice. There has to be something that um, I want to feel like the person telling me the story, whether it be a third person narrator or a first person storyteller is someone that I just like hanging out with and I want to spend time with and I want to see what they're going to say next. Um, I think pacing is really important for me. YA especially, a lot of the books are super long, like 500 pages is not out of the norm for YA, whereas for crime fiction, 
you're going to have a hell of a good story to hold a reader for 500 pages. Yeah. Um, I can't even imagine a 500 word mystery story. Right. There have been a couple. Um, they're usually big names. And I think sometimes it's that the people are big enough. Their editors really are too scared to tell them to, you know, whack 150 pages off of that. But um, I think for me, character development is really important. It's important to me that a character rings true and that they don't have too many quirks. Like, you know, you want your character to stand out, but, you know, the average person that you know, they've got a couple of quirks. They don't have 15. That is just not a thing that happens in real life. And if it is, you do not want to spend time with that person <laughs> because they're obnoxious. So I think just an era of verisimilitude, the ability to surprise like I want to be surprised. It doesn't have to be a twist in mystery. It can be something surprising about a character or surprising, oh, I don't know, setting or something. Just, um, I think, you know, probably about, if it's about a 350 word book, I have found that if the big twist doesn't happen after, uh, before the hundred page mark, I'm gonna, you know, ding you for pacing. It's, it's shocking to me how, if you open any mystery novel and you go to about the hundred page mark, that is almost always where the big twist happens. And if it doesn't, there's usually something wrong with the way the book is structured. Um, Interesting. I, yeah, I, uh, I just like, yeah, hope everybody's paying attention and... out there. If you're a writer, I hope you're paying attention to that. It makes me think, okay, I better run back and look at my manuscript right now that, that my agent has. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I noticed it because you have to, do page citations for Kirkus and Publishers Weekly Reviews. Anything that you write that is plot synopsis, you have to back up with a page site. And so I tend to take kind of uh, notes as I go, at least for the first, you know, 150 pages or so, just so I remember character names, ages, like where they occur in books. And I did just like, that's just something I noticed based on taking notes with page sites that I realized that like, that's always where that twist happens it's just kind of I don't think anyone ever internalized that I asked my husband you know do you do that on purpose he's like that's not the way and he looked in his books and that's exactly what <laughs> happens it's always at that point so I think it's just something we kind of internalize like that first act first act twist I suppose because there's like that classic three act structure you know I've had a lot of writers on of late that came from tv writing or Hollywood mm. uh so, you know either screenplays or on TV screenplays, you know, movies or TV. And I I have started to feel I can tell when someone has come from a lot long time writing for television in particular because the pacing is really fast. Yeah. Characters tend to be shorter. They get to the to you know the, usually there's more plot plot twists and things and they happen faster. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, do you do you see the same thing or do you notice when somebody maybe is, can you tell if they've come from a medium like television or movies? You know, I don't know. I think probably you could a little while ago, but I think television has be become so popular and kind of like high art television. Like it's not the, you know, crappy sitcoms, like really cheesy stuff that we grew up on that where the pacing is terrible. I think the quality of TV writing has so, has gotten so good and we've kind of consumed so much more of it, especially with the pandemic, that people have kind of internalized that and I think it affects their writing. So like, you know, Lou Burney, for example, and Lisa Lutz, both very talented screenwriters and their writing is fantastic and pacing. They've got a great sense of rhythm, but I don't know if it's because they were screenwriters or they're good screenwriters because they're, you know, talented with pacing right. and, and structure. Right, absolutely. Um, what? The, how much input do you get uh, on the books you review? I know you said uh, maybe you referenced the percentage. How does that work? Do, do, they, do you have to review a certain number overall, or is it a certain ratio or percentage of the books that they want you to do? Do you get to say flat out, no, I don't want to review that? How, how does all of that work for you? So it differs based on the outlet. When I reviewed, when I had my column at Mystery Scene, that was entirely me. I picked the books that I wanted. You know, they said they wanted a, it was small and independent press. So that was the requirement, but it, you know, was, and had to be a mystery. But I could pick, you know, noir, cozy, speculative fiction, anything that I could reasonably argue had a mystery component to it was fair game. And that was 
great. I never got any pushback on anything I chose. Carcass and Publishers Weekly. I do not choose the books that I write. I can only turn down an assignment or if there is a true conflict of interest, like if they, you know, told me to review one of my husband's books, I could say, no, that's, you know, a conflict of interest. Or if the book is just got, I think I've only turned maybe one or two down in the many years that I've been doing this. And that's just because I found the subject matter just grotesque or reprehensible. And I, I just couldn't keep reading the book. Like that's very rare, but I've got very, very kind understanding editors. And if you write to them and say, look, this is why this book is not for me. I don't, I'm not going to judge whether it deserves coverage or not. That's not up to me, but I know that I should not be the person covering, covering it because they will not get a fair, fair shake from me. I hate it. <laughs> and they'll be like, yeah, we'll sign it elsewhere. So sorry. Um, when I signed on, I gave them a list of kind of favorite authors, um, types of books that I liked, uh, I types of books that I don't like. Um, I'm not really much of a noir gritty depressive fest kind of person. I will read them if they're assigned to me, but they're not my my favorite. Um, I do love to tell people that if they've got kind of a weird book and they don't know who to send it to or how to categorize it to send it to me because those tend to be the kind of books that really speak to me. I like finding the funky stuff that they wouldn't maybe wouldn't get coverage because they don't know where to put it. Um, I am lucky enough, especially with my YA editors, that they know what edit, what bigger authors I really, really like, and they will tend to assign those to me, um, which is just kind of a perk of being in the gig for long enough, I think. Uh, and Carcass too, on some some level, like if you really want a book, you can request it. There's no guarantee you'll get it. Right. Do you and ever I, get books that you just really don't like? I mean, I, I presume you have to finish them regardless. But, oh, yeah. Finish but, them and uh, review them. Yep. How, <laughs> how do you approach that when you, you think, you know, I just really didn't like this book? Yeah, I mean, I will say that to my husband, of course, <laughs> to nobody else. Uh, I try very hard to, you know, having lived many years with a writer and all of my friends are writers. Um, I know how much blood, sweat and tears goes into writing a book and getting it published. There's a reason that author chose to write it. There's a reason the agent agreed to shop it. There's a reason the editor decided to publish it. Um, so I don't think almost anything that gets traditionally published is completely without merit. And I try to look at it as if I was the intended audience for that book. What would I think of it if the book were written for me? How would I evaluate it then? And um, that's how I try to approach the review. I don't, it doesn't matter if I do or do not like the author personally, that never enters in. Um, and you know, sometimes if I really, I'll slip in some adjectives that kind of show what the tone of the book is, and maybe the author will take that as a compliment where I did not intend it as a compliment, <laughs> especially if it's like really gritty or um, unrelentingly bleak, that sort of thing. Um, but no, I, I do write negative reviews. I do not set out to write hit pieces because that's devastating and it doesn't do anybody any good, frankly, but. Well, you know, uh, it's interesting. I, I I went to a panel at VoucherCon, and I've been at other panels on it that address this issue. And I've often asked writers how they deal with negative reviews, and most of them are not coming from professional reviewers like yourself. You know, they're from from somebody bought the book on Amazon and then felt compelled to mm -hmm. go on and you know tell them how it was the worst thing they'd ever read and yeah. that kind of a thing. I'm not. That thing is that's that that's a very different thing than what I'm asking you. But have you ever had a writer get mad at you over the review or say, hey, you just totally missed the point, something along those lines? Thankfully, I have no byline on my PW and Kirkus review because it is the publication's review and not mine. Um, so no one, thankfully, um, can track me down <laughs> a bad review of one of their books. You do sometimes get curious if you write a negative review and sometimes kind of you know, skulk in their Twitter timeline just to, to see how it was taken and kind of hope that it wasn't too devastating. Um, and a couple people who were just like, yeah, they totally didn't get it. I can't believe they didn't understand my genius. Um, and that's fine. I totally understand that. I, you know, I, I feel bad. I don't hold it against them. And hopefully they 
brush off and move right along. The thing about, you know, Kirkus in particular, I know tends to be kind of snarkier than PW. But the thing I always like to tell writers is like, especially with trade reviews, it's not like the average person sits down and reads Publisher Weekly from cover to cover every week. Like bookstores, librarian, sure. But like your friend, your neighbor, they're never going to know that review exists unless you tell them. And your publicist is going to find a way to pick out something good and marketable from that review or just not mention it. So, you know, just especially with the non, the less public facing, like newspapers, maybe like if you get a pen in your local paper, your mom's going to see it and I'm sorry. But like with trade reviews, try to take some comfort in the fact that um, if you get a bad one, it's not the end of the world. There were other trade reviews going to come out. You're going to get other reviews. Um, hopefully on book blogs and bookstagrammers, there were plenty of people out there who job or who consider their job to be just to be cheerleaders for books and don't ever write negative reviews. And, you know, I might not like it, but I write it for Kirkus, but maybe PW will love it. That happens a lot, actually, that the trades don't agree with each other. So right. just try not to let it ruin your week. Maybe your morning, fine, but then try to move on. Right. Absorb it. Move on. Exactly. Now, now you've noted you're married um, to a writer, of course, the very eclectic uh, Christopher Holm. Yeah. He has been, of course, very successful. Um, and you you addressed this just a little bit earlier, but I'm going to bring it up again. Does being married to a writer, has, has that made you more sympathetic overall to writers? Are you allowed to, to let that sympathy in general for writers uh, seep into your work. I mean, do you ever find yourself saying, you know, this is this is hard. I don't want to say the thing here, right? Because I know it's going to devastate this person, but it's the truth from my perspective. I mean, how how much does that play into it, knowing that you're surrounded by writers everywhere? Yeah. You know, it, it factors in quite a lot. I think I have, I don't know if I've softened <laughs> with age, but I definitely... I like to sit back now and kind of take a day to think about the book and be like, okay, was my knee jerk? You know, was I in a bad mood? I was in a bad place. Am I being unfair? Am I being overly critical? Do I have to like mention all of these things that I had a problem with? Or was there something that was like a, a big enough flaw that it's undermining the work and is worth mentioning? I try, I nitpick less, I think, just because I see what goes into every single decision. Like, you know, they get caught up on a setting for three days and you're like really no one's going to notice that and then if I get myself reading you know some kind of minor detail I just try to let it go because you know don't only don't sweat the little stuff just kind of sweat the big stuff um but yeah I've gotten I definitely put more thought into my reviews I think because I know what goes into the books you know Getting reviews is one of the hardest things, I think, for a lot of writers, right? Just getting reviews is really oh, yeah. challenging. Yeah. Um, and and particularly Kirkus. I've actually had people ask me a lot of late, you know, how do I get a Kirkus review? How Or how mm -hmm. do I get, you know, my book noticed by these particular reviewers? Um, I don't know if you have any input on that area or not, but do you have any suggestions for, for writers for, for how they... So maybe could stand the best chance of getting their book in front of somebody like yourself? Um, I don't have a whole lot of visibility on that. I mean, I can tell you as I, you know, I review for Kirkus and my husband didn't get a Kirkus review for his last book. Um, and I've had plenty of people come up to me at this last conference that'd be like, why well, didn't Kirkus review my book? Or some people saying, why didn't PW review my book? You know, I think the industry, like picture how many books these editors are getting just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and what it takes to like capture their attention. Um, I think having a persistent publicist is probably key. Make sure that the publicist, you know, knows that the book is, you know, make sure the publicist makes sure that it, the book is on the radar of the editor of whatever you're submitting to. Um, for people with smaller, uh, who don't maybe don't have publicists or are doing it themselves um, and are just doing it for blogs or whatever, be respectful, you know, of their time don't harangue people um read guidelines like if there are there's always a way most websites it doesn't matter how big or how small have a procedure for how they want to get book pitches and what the pitches should include 
make sure that you follow the instructions because um, you're not going to get on someone's good side if you're like, I don't have to, you know, adhere to these guidelines that they slaved over and purposely put on their website. I'm going to, you know, spam you every day for two months until you have to notice me. It's definitely not going to work. Yeah, so, you know, we, I think everyone's heard stories about that that writer who does that thing, right? Where they, uh, <laughs> it's a long story, so I won't, uh, the shortest version is I encountered a, a writer uh, one time who sounded kind of interesting. He was putting together uh, like a uh, short story anthology website that sounded kind of interesting. And then he started, he let slip out or maybe intentionally, you know, started railing on the industry for being too woke and, um, you know, uh, publishing writers who didn't have anywhere near the talent he had. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I hear that, I'm immediately like, okay, we're done having this conversation, right? Because, yeah. you know, as you know, there's a million reasons why writers get published in the traditional realm and yeah. a million reasons why they don't. And they don't always have to do with the quality of the work or what have you. There's all kinds of things that go on. And, but as soon as a lot of luck in this business, yeah. Oh my God, yes. And timing and the right editor in the right place at the right time in the right mood. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, there's all kinds of things that happen there. And so, but when someone goes right away to the, you know, that, that card, I, I've stopped listening to them. So, yeah. um, it's kind of a lead into the question though. Uh, for you, as you know, you have a lot of writers as friends and acquaintances, and of course, your husband. Mm -hmm. um, when people know you're a reviewer, do you do you get that at parties? Do you have people sidling up to you at parties and going, so Katrina, <laughs> you know, I got this book and it's going to be coming out in March. What are, how do I get this in front of you? Sometimes. And I'm like, you know, I have no idea. You'll have to ask your publicist. <laughs> that's, the, that's the nice thing about having that kind of intermediary like you know they don't know what I do or don't review I'm like oh maybe I already read it you don't know um, maybe I loved it maybe I hated it maybe you know I'll pick it up after the fact but um I think I'll tell them the same thing just make sure that your publicist has a good pitch and they get it in front of the right editor sometimes I'll make sure they they know where to pitch it over at PW or Kirkus but unfortunately you know that's not a whole lot of help that I can offer which I think is a good thing <laughs> I want to ask you too, you know, now I noted that, you know, uh, clearly you're a writer as well. I know you've, you've done, um, of course, the reviews are, are always so well written. I read many of them, of your reviews going back years, uh, preparing for today. And, you know, I think the, that the format is far more challenging than most people think. Writing in a, oh yeah, I mean, anybody could sit down and write five, not anybody, that's a terrible way to put it. A lot of writers could sit down and write 5,000 words on something about they liked or didn't like, right? That's what we do. But, you know, to have 200 words or 500 words or whatever the, the word count is, is really hard for a lot of writers to stick to. Yeah. Um, you know, what have, what have you thought about your own writing? Has any of this ever inspired you to say, you know, I think I have a book in me. I've certainly seen what works and what doesn't work. Or do you prefer to be on this side of the of the page and saying, no, I really, I'm a reader and a and an analyst of all of this and i think that's my best my best fit here i mean what what do you think for yourself in your own writing i mean i'd be lying if i didn't say that i had a couple of book ideas like popping around my my laptop um the difficulty for me is probably twofold is a finding the time i have a lot of difficulty saying no when people come to me with um new gigs or adding more books or doing favors and stuff like that so there's not a whole lot of time um, to get down words that are not about other people's work. And then also, I think just seeing how much other good fiction is out there. And there's a lot like, yeah, there, I've read some stinkers, but there's so many truly amazing books and truly talented authors that it's kind of daunting, you know? And you see, you look around, especially at a place like VoucherCon, you're just looking at a panel like, God, all of these people just hundreds and, you know, well, I suppose it's thousands of people at VoucherCon had what it takes to have this idea, sit down, power through, you know, turn it into a fully fledged book and get it published, which is a really incredible thing when you think about it. Like, 
it's just amazing. And it's, it's, it's daunting, especially when you've got, like, I've got some really talented friends and it's kind of terrifying the idea of, you know, putting something out there and showing it to them. Like it's the one thing to show it to you, like your mom or something, but like when you've got friends that are New York Times bestsellers and Edgar winners, you're just like, here's my, here's my little thing that I did. Right. Absolutely. I I completely understand. Maybe someday, but. Well, we'll watch for it. And, uh. (laughs) You know, I won't review it though. We'll 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 give you that. <laughs> you know, no one needs that from me. Um, I always like to end on what I hope is a fun question. I certainly mean for it to fun question uh, be a fun question. Um, I let's just say I have the power to put you together with one of the following three people. Who would who would you choose to hang out with? Maybe have dinner or drink, whatever with. And um, knowing your affinity for Portland, Maine. I've op- I'm going to give you the all main option today. Ooh. So all three of these people are prominent folks from the great state of Maine. So which one of these three, given the opportunity, would you get want to hang out with for a little bit? Your options are uh, the actor, probably best known for Seinfeld, uh, or the Westminster Dog Show, which is where I see him these days, John O'Hurley, uh, the great poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, or... Uh, the darling young actress Anna Kendrick all are from Maine you could hang out with one of them I have that power who would you choose and why oh man you know I think while Anna Kendrick would be a lot of fun I would probably choose Longfellow because he's got such a large kind of presence in this town Um, his original house is just down the street from my office Oh, and I he used to occupy this kind of um he owned all the land from like the Portland's kind of built on a hill mm-hmm. and he, his house is kind of right downtown and he owned all of the land all the way down to like this little back cove that we have in Portland and you can still go in and walk around his wall garden um it's free it's free entry and I would love to talk to him about what Portland was like back in the day and kind of what the literary scene was like back then too and kind of what it inspired him to come here and what about Portland inspired him I think that would be a lot of fun well there you go uh Henry Wadsworth Longfellow is is the choice of the day Mm -hmm. wow you know Katrina thank you so much for coming on and shedding some light on how reviewers do what you do I think it's going to be very enlightening for a lot of authors because I mean honestly I've been around this for a long time it never even occurred to me how it might work and I think I like to think I would speak for a lot of people and say, it sounds like you really take what you do very seriously. You give it your absolute all to, to give a, a, a fair and enlightened and, and uh, balanced review of people's work. And I think that's all anybody ought to be yeah. hoping and, at, and expecting. So kudos, really appreciate Thank that. So and uh, really appreciate you coming on the show and, and sharing all this information with everybody. So, and it was fun meeting you at VoucherCon too. It was great meeting you too. I thought that was a, a really fun panel. It was nice to have like not an entire panel of reviewers, like standard, trip, you know, traditional reviewers for once. Like that cross section was great. Yeah, it was fun. It was a fun thing. And, you know, that was a great event. And it's one of those things I would suggest to, to aspiring authors. You know, it's, yeah. it's one of the great reasons that, you know, you go to Left Coast Prime or BoucherCon or Killer yeah. Nashville or any of the big conferences is to meet other folks. They may not all be in your particular area of expertise, um, but, you know, that's even better. You get to learn yeah. a lot of things. And if, as a writer, I said, I'm, I'm a reporter by trade. And it's the thing yeah. I always tell our young folks. If you're not curious, this is the wrong business for you. Right. You got to yeah. be interested in what other people are doing and what they have to say and what their perspectives are. And, and um, you know, the conference is a great place for that. So that's a little yeah. side pitch for, yeah. for going to conferences. So yep. anyway, uh, Katrina, thank you very much. Thank um, you. And I'm going to I'm going to remind folks one more time. The show is on YouTube, of course, the open mic writers in their own words. That's the key part because there's lots of open mics and most of them are about musicians, surprisingly okay. enough. Uh, but if you if you add the tagline writers in their own words, you'll find us and all of the all of the folks who have been so gracious as to come on the show in the last couple of years. And uh, if you go on any major podcast platform, you will find us too. same name. Uh, please subscribe, whichever one you're doing. That really does help other people find it. Leave me a review. That would really be great. Uh, get that reviewer. Leave me a review. <laughs> um, but that does help folks find the show. And I think it's a, it would be great if they knew about the opportunity to hear 
uh, from folks like Katrina. So please, if you wouldn't mind, do me that solid. Uh, Katrina, one more time, I'll say thank you. Thank uh, you. Appreciate it. And I will leave everybody with the same thing I always leave you with, which is tomorrow is not promised to any of us. So please make today count. Until next time, uh, I'm Rich Eisen. For my guest, uh, Katrina Nita's home. Uh, this has been The Open Mic. <laughs> <laughs>